Hi, and welcome back to Leslie's Lab. Uh, in this episode, I'm just going to answer a couple of questions that you've all had on uh, dye lasers. Uh, one of them came from Mike Harrison. He wanted to know if you could mix dyes in a single cuvette and have it produce uh, many, many colors at the same time. Uh, and somebody else had asked, well, how even is it that focusing nitrogen lasers into a thin line on a cuvette even starts lasing in the first place? So let's take a look at those things. Mike Harrison had asked if it was possible to take uh, several different dyes and mix them together in the same cuvette and have them lasing at several different wavelengths all at the same time. So let's take a look and see what would happen there. Um, at first glance, uh, we'll, we'll draw out some emission curves for these dyes. So Camarin 1, for example, emits between about 400 and 500 nanometers, and it will form a nice little bell curve, or sort of bell-shaped tuning curve. Rhodamine 6G will emit somewhere between about 550 nanometers or so, all the way to like 630 or thereabouts. Um, so there's Rhodamine 6, there's Camarin 1. Um, and then Rhodamine B will emit somewhere in the red. And it looks at first glance like we could simply, well, we could just mix these three dyes and put them in a cuvette and uh, we'd have a white light output that we'd be able to tune almost continuously from uh, 400 nanometers all the way through to, through to like 700 nanometers. Um, but there's something else we need to take into consideration and that's the absorption curves as well. So Camarin 1 likes to absorb in the ultraviolet um, way down here. So there's Camarin 1's absorption curve. Um, so far, so good. Rhodamine 6G's absorption curve overlaps the emission curve for Camarin 1. Um, so now we have a problem uh, in that if we try and run Rhodamine and Camarin 1 in the same cuvette, Rhodamine is going to steal energy from the emission from our Camarin 1. Uh, likewise, Rhodamine B's absorption curve is around about here. Uh, it'll overlap the Rhodamine 6G absorption curve and so it will steal energy from Rhodamine 6G as well. So what we'll get is some very pretty white looking fluorescence in the cuvette, but none of these things will effectively laze. They'll all compete with each other for gain in the cavity. Um, I suppose we could be, you know, we could try and be sensible with this and we could say, well, uh, we could take Camarin 1 and its absorption curve down here and then we could just mix it with Rhodamine B and see what would happen. And that's what we'll look at today. Um, this will work, but once again, it, it's still stealing energy one way or the other. Uh, some dyes are chemically incompatible with each other, which makes life even worse. Um, you know, but yeah, so we'd, we'd expect to get some output out of Rhodamine B and Camarin 1, but we wouldn't expect, you know, vast, brilliant uh, beams that we could blow smoke through or anything cool like that. But still, it's an interesting experiment. If you look this kind of stuff up in the scientific literature, people have been trying to get white light dye lasers for years. Um, and there's been a couple of successes. Uh, one I was reading a while ago had a selection of dyes whose absorption was all in the ultraviolet. Um, so there was a Camarin dye whose absorption was in the ultraviolet and then they used some really, really um, interesting bespoke homemade dyes, ones that had been manufactured in the lab specifically for these purposes. I think one of them was Dancil al Alanine um, and it had really strong absorption in the ultraviolet but wasn't absorbing very much in the blue and so they, they managed to mix these dyes together and get something meaningful out of it. Um, but yeah, pretty cool stuff. It, it'd be interesting. I know that uh, John Singer, uh, go and check his website. I'll link it in down below. Uh, check out his website. He managed to get red, green, and blue lasing simultaneously. And uh, that's pretty cool to see as well. But once again, you know, you can't expect that the output from these is going to be incredibly bright. You're not going to run a, la a, a light show with a, an RGB dye laser for sure. Anyway, let's go and set up a little experiment and try this out. So I have a little experiment set up here to demonstrate the mixing of dyes in a cuvette. I've got the usual setup, a nitrogen laser pumping at the homemade dye laser. The homemade dye laser, I've modified the rear reflector so that it's just an ordinary high reflector now and not a diffraction grating. Um, I don't want to be able to try and tune this, but I want maximum, uh, maximum gain in the cavity, as it were. In the cuvette itself, I've got a mixture of Camarin 1 and Rhodamine B. Um, so these two dyes, the absorption curves, they overlap, but not, uh, not terribly. We should be able to get gain happening in both of these things. Uh, the beam comes out and is reflected off this mirror here towards our target, uh, which is just a bit of white paper. And in between the target is a 600 lines per millimeter diffraction grating that I've mounted in there. So it'll split off the beam into its component parts. Let's fire this up and take a look. So we're running at 30 hertz here. And we can see on the left is Camarin 1, and then on the right we can see our red output from Rhodamine B. The red output is very, very dim, and uh, as I've said before, these two dyes will compete for gain with each other, and it's really quite interesting. If I turn the repetition rate down uh, to about 20 hertz, 
um, our Rhodamine B ends up a little bit brighter and the Camarin one ends up a little bit dimmer. Um, but if we go up to 40 hertz, um, our Rhodamine B output has almost disappeared. In fact, it's gone now. Interesting. If we go up to 50, 60, 70, 80. Um, you know, our Camarin 1 output's looking pretty healthy, uh, but we can see no Rhodamine B at all. We get back down to 30 hertz, and suddenly Rhodamine B's emission reappears. Really, really fascinating. Um, perhaps it'd be worth my time, you know, I've, I've been doing a little bit of research over the last couple of months into mixing dyes together because it would be kind of sweet to get an actual, you know, decently performing RGB dye laser. Um, and there's a few dyes I'm looking into at the moment. The problem with these, the problem with compatible dyes is they tend to be really, really terribly, terribly expensive. Um, but still, you know, it's, it's, it's maybe worth exploring this and uh, seeing if we can get like RGB output from the thing and uh, at a decent repetition rate, that would be kind of nice. If you've seen some of my other videos, you'll be familiar with this homemade dye laser. Uh, the dye laser actually, on the surface of it, looks really, really simple, right? We've got a cylindrical lens at the front here, um, and we direct a nitrogen laser beam through it, and it focuses the light into a very, very thin line on the surface of the dye. Um, as for the cavity, it's very, very simple. We've got a, a, a partially reflective mirror at the front, uh, nothing too exciting there. And at the back, in place of a high reflector, we've got a diffraction grating so that we can tune our output, uh, you know, depending on the dye. So this is rhodamine, so we can tune it from orange through to um, like green, right, for example. Um, and if we had Camarin 1 in there, we could tune it from blue through to green and so on, right, just by altering the angle of the diffraction grating. The thing that seems to perplex people the most is, well, how is it that focusing um, another laser onto a, onto a die cell into a line does it set up lasing action? Um, so let's have a look at a little happy diagram to um, sort of clarify this. Um, here's my little diagram of a cavette. Um, so we've got a cavette here with Rhodamine 6G and we're shining at it the focused light from a nitrogen laser into a line on the surface of the cavette. And mysteriously, um, we get a laser beam coming out of the back and a laser beam coming out of the front. And people were sort of asking, well, why is it, why is it working like that? Like what's happening in there to make that happen? In some other uh, nitrogen laser videos, um, you'll notice that we can actually do this with no mirrors as well. And, and still uh, we get laser beams exiting the front and the back of the cavette. So it's kind of interesting, right? If we actually zoom in on this section um, and take a look what's going on behind the wall there, uh, we'll just draw as a glass cavette wall. Um, we've got our nitrogen laser beam coming in and it's focused into a point uh, and just behind the cavette wall is a very, very tiny region. It's sort of teardrop shaped, I guess, a very, or, or diamond shaped even, a very, very tiny region where lasing actually occurs. And this region is, is really, really small. You know, you're looking at like a tenth of a millimeter from the top to the bottom of it. It's really quite narrow. Um, so if we think about it, if we've got a medium uh, that supports stimulated emission whereby a photon can bump into another molecule and cause it to emit another photon of a similar colour, um, photons crossing like vertically or horizontally this medium um, aren't going to have very much opportunity to collide with other molecules and cause stimulated emission. So we're not getting stimulated emission coming out from all directions um, out of this game media. Um, on the other hand, if we happen, you know, and the same, same here with this diagram, if we've got a, a line that we've focused, if we've got a photon that heads off in this direction, well, it's not really going to collide with any other uh, stimulated dye molecules. But if we happen to have a photon that happens to be traveling in the same direction um, as the illuminated line, then it's got every chance of colliding with an excited dye molecule. And so we end up with photon emission coming out the front and photon emission coming out the back. I suppose another way to look at it would be if we were to take uh, ruby lasers, for example. Um, here is a very, very small ruby rod, uh, which will end up in a miniature ruby laser project at some point. Um, that's essentially what, we, what, what manufacturers do when they design laser rods, is you design a rod that's far longer on one axis than it is on the other. And so photons traveling through the rod are more likely to, um, you know, in, in this case, ex uh, uh, collide with, uh, with, with other chromium atoms and cause them to emit their light um, than if photons were to travel light across the rod. Um, they're less likely to cause stimulated emission to occur. Um, so pretty cool. Um, as for these things lasing without mirrors, um, yes, dye lasers, if you hit them hard enough, 
um, will laze completely without mirrors because of this exact effect, right? We've got photons that are traveling along the axis of the, uh, of, of the sort of, of, of the fluorescence, as it were, and they've got every opportunity to collide with um, an atom that's already in its excited state. Um, let's see that because it's a really, really cool thing to see. So I have the nitrogen laser set up and it's running at about 50 hertz. In front of the aperture is a small cylindrical lens. And if I hold a fluorescent target in front of it, we can see quite a large spot. But as we get closer, um, we end up in a situation where it's focused into a line. Um, let's take a covet of rhodamine 6G and hold it in the beam path. And we can see that it's fluorescing quite brightly, but nothing's happening yet. There's no lasing. Photons are being emitted in all directions. Um, but as we move closer and closer, uh, to the point where we focus into a line, we'll suddenly see the laser beam appear out of the back of the cavette. Absolutely fantastic. You'll notice there's lots of beams as well. There's, there's, there seems to be two beams. And if I tilt the cavette so that the reflections from the cavette reflect back and forth, we suddenly end up with a very, very bright spot. Absolutely fantastic. Let's try that with Kumarin 1 as well. Um, same deal, if we hold it over here, uh, we've got bright fluorescence, but once we get to the point where it's focused into a line, our laser beam appears, and once again, there's reflections coming from all over the place, so if we tilt the cavette, we can get those reflections to amplify um, along that fluorescent channel as well. So we tilt it that way. In fact, if we tilt it far enough, lasing will cease, right? But there becomes a point where enough photons are reflected backwards and forwards in the channel that we get gain. This is really, really cool. It's like lasing in your hand. Absolutely fantastic. Let's, uh, let's get some smoke on the go. I'll get some magic on out and we'll see if you know, it's, it's good enough to produce beams in the dark. Absolutely fantastic. So, so we've got a, a cavette that's just lasing by itself there. And we can see as we, as we tilt it to the point where, it, where internal reflections um, contribute to the gain of the laser. And um, we can see it gets brighter and we can see a fantastic beam through the smoke. Really, really nice. Cool. Let's try that with uh, Kamarin 1. This is another high gain die and right away Absolutely fantastic laser beam coming out of the thing. Really nice. And you, you know, once again, when you, when you tilt the cavity and move it in and out of the beam, we move it into focus and out of focus, um, we can see the effects that that actually has on lasing. Really nice. Thanks for watching this episode of Leslie's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below, and I will see you guys next time.